All right, today I'm preaching on feeding of the 5,000. So the title of my sermon is Feeding the 5,000. And uh, I'll go through the story, point out a few things that maybe you didn't uh, notice about the story, uh, and also some, uh, some, obviously some spiritual applications and some other things surrounding the feeding the 5,000 that you may not have known. So focusing on that passage in Matthew 14 that we just read where Jesus fed the 5,000, well, that's what it's known as. Uh, we'll learn a bit about it today. So when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the city. So this is where Jesus has, is healing people. There's a multitude following him. Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. So you see this whole huge crowd is following him. I mean, we don't really fathom how many people is 5,000 people. I mean, it's, this is a huge crowd. Um, I mean, if you think about when we went to the conference yesterday, I mean, maybe that was over 1, 1,500 people. Um, this is five, I mean, our church is like, what, about 40 people? So let's say, let's say, for example, our church was 50 people. That would be like 100 times, 100 of the church in Liverpool's you know, congregation. I mean, that's a huge number if you think about how many people were there. So there's this huge crowd is following them um, and we see later on the 5,000 is, is only just men, the men that are being counted. So this huge crowd is fine. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place. So they're out kind of like in the middle of nowhere, right? And this time, the time is now past where they're saying it's getting late. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. So what are they saying to Jesus? They're saying, man, it's getting late. You better tell people to start sort of disbanding so they can get something to eat so that they don't sort of start getting really hungry and fainting. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. So this is interesting where he says to the disciples, you know, they don't need to go away. Why don't you, you feed? Obviously, that's completely unreasonable, right? And we learn later on, and we're going to look into John, you know, this is why Jesus is saying these things. So Jesus is saying, hey, well, you feed them. They say unto him, well, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. Right? So they just say, we've just got five loaves of bread, two fishes. I don't know what these fishes are. I mean, I don't know uh, if these fishes are kept you know, raw, or whether they're dried or whatnot. But somebody had two fishes and five loaves. He said, bring them hither to me. So they bring these five loaves and two fishes to Jesus. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude now what i can't wrap my head around this story is how long it took to distribute all this food because sometimes when i watch it being depicted in in shows like in a movie Jesus just kind of prays and then just like from, from behind the curtain, they just sort of start like bringing out these big trays of like loaves of bread and fishes that are... But you notice that Jesus took the bread and the fish and it's like as he, he broke it. So they were actually, you know, it's not like when they depict it that it's just like these unbroken French baguettes, right? With like, you know, fresh fish. I mean, I don't know what the fish is like, and it's just the fish is just all laid out. And I mean, he's breaking apart this food and breaking apart the fish to feed it. And yeah, sometimes I just wonder, I mean, I don't know how long this took to, to, as he's breaking. And it's just, it's like he's breaking the bread and it just like, he breaks it and he can just keep breaking it. It just keeps coming but to the point where it's feeding 5,000 people and then the baskets are going up. I guess the, the people maybe naturally just carrying baskets and maybe they're emptying it to put it in the food and to get the food out everywhere. But this is a huge monster. You know, how long did this take? But, you know, it took a while, I would say. And they did all eat and were filled. Now, if we think about, and I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but if we think about what does the bread, really, like if you think about what does it represent in this story, I mean, it represents the word of God. It represents Jesus Christ, right? As the word manifest in the flesh. So if we keep that in mind, we can sometimes think, how, how can this have some spiritual application in terms of what is happening here and why Jesus did it this way? So in, 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 what is interesting here is when, when Jesus 
got everyone to sit down. We learn later on that he got him, them to sit down by hundreds, by fifties into groups. But it, when he was breaking the bread, it wasn't buffet style, right? It wasn't like he broke it out. And this is what we would normally do at a function, right? Table one, you go get your food. All right, once you get your food, you go back. Table two, you go get your food. But that's not how it works. How it works is he gave the loaves to his disciples and his disciples to the multitude. Right, so there is a multitude that is in different groups, but he doesn't go, you group, come here and get your food, and then you go back. You group, come and get your food and go back. No, it's, he commands his disciples and says, go and take the food to them. So what is that teaching us? Right, we shouldn't expect the multitude to come here for God's word. Right, we have to take God's word to the groups that are out there, to the multitude. Right? So I think that's interesting that he did it that way, that he didn't get the multitude to come to him. Why? Because it's go and teach all nations. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You're getting ready to go. And it's like here, the disciples are given the task to then go out and give God's word to the multitude, give the bread to the multitude. And look at this. And they did all eat. Right, so everyone that you know was there ate and were filled. So this is where you know the analogy, obviously, because it's not just like everyone you bring the word to receives the word, right? But the people that did eat, right? Because the people that were willing to receive what you got out there, because you know, were there people in the crowd maybe that are just like oh, I've got my own food, I don't need Jesus' food. That could represent people when you go and preach to them, they reject God's word, right? But the people here, obviously the story tells us, you know, everyone ate and they were all filled. So what is that, if we think about God's word, what, what that makes me think is, hey, not only was God's word is enough for your sins, it's enough for all your sins. You know, so when God's word saves you, it's, to me, this is like sort of alluding, this passage here is alluding to eternal security. Is that not, it's not like the idea where only your sins in the past are forgiven and now you've got to do the rest, or Jesus does his part and you've got to do your part. No, the bread that Jesus gave them was enough, not just for them to have some, but still be hungry. No, they all ate and they were all filled. So it was enough for everybody and it was completed, right? And they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. So not only did everybody eat what they needed to eat to be satisfied and be filled, there was food left over. And that's a sad truth, isn't it? That what Jesus did on the cross is enough to save everyone in the whole world. But unfortunately, not, it doesn't all get used in a sense. It doesn't get all applied to everyone. There is left over, but you see the grace of God and the love of God is over and above what the world requires in order to be saved, right? But it, you know, it doesn't all get used up, unfortunately, uh, in terms of spiritually. And they, had, and they that had eaten, look at this, were about 5,000 men, so I don't know how familiar you guys are with this story, beside women and children. So we think of the story as he fed the 5,000. But you know what? There are actually more than 5,000 there. The 5,000 that are being counted are the 5,000 men. But there were even more. Who knows how many? Right? Because let's say, you know, one man has his wife and a few kids. So it's not actually the feeding of the 5,000. It could be the feeding of the 10,000, the feeding of the 15,000. And this crowd is humongous, if you think about it. So... Amazing, amazing miracle that happens here. Um, so some of the things you may not have noticed in that story. Now let's look at the feeding of the 5,000 from John's perspective. And in John 6, we get a bit more insight into what's happening during the feeding of the 5,000. And we'll look at this in John 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Again, he's healing the people, so his story is lining up because it, it's the same account, right? And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. <clears throat> when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? So you remember how he says, Give ye them to eat, 
So same thing here, he's saying to Philip here, hey, from whence is from where, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? So now, you know, so you're wondering, why is he saying two different things? Well, because one he's saying to all his disciples, this one he, you can see he's saying directly unto Philip, right? So Philip is like, hey, where are we, where are we gonna buy bread that these may eat? Whereas maybe to somebody else in his group, he was saying, hey, why don't you go buy something to eat, right? And they're like, well, you know, 200 penny worth is not enough. Well, he, here he's saying it directly to Philip, and this is what Philip said. But look, we get insight into why Jesus said it. So, and this is why we need to understand when Jesus, and that's why you, you need to take always the Bible as a whole, because you can, you can take things Jesus says, even in the Gospels, out of context, right? And here we see Jesus is saying something, but he's not actually telling them to go and buy for 10, 15,000 people. In John, he tells us here, and this he said to prove him. Well, he himself knew what he would do. So Jesus knows he's about to feed everyone, but the reason why he's saying these things to his disciples is because he's trying to reveal their heart, right? He says, says these things to them to see what they're thinking, to prove him, to see what Philip was going to respond as. Look at what Philip says. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. So you see here what's happening. Jesus is trying to get his disciples to realize, first of all, who he is, and that there's this, there's a, that it's like they don't realize who Jesus is, where, you know, they're, they're walking and talking with the Son of God. Obviously, they don't have the finances to feed this whole crowd, but still, Philip is trying to figure out, man, like, even if we had this much money, everyone's only going to get a little bit, rather than just thinking, well, I'm here with the Son of God in the flesh, surely, you can do something about this, right? So you see how they, they, they that's why he says you, you still have so little faith, right? Because they're not trusting that God is able to, to do this. So he says to Philip, Philip says 200 penny worth of bread. It's not sufficient for them. So what's a penny? If you think about a penny is a day's wages in, in those days. So he's saying 200 days of work would not even be enough for everyone, even if they had a little bit. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. So this is where we find out in John 6 where those five loaves and two fishes came from. It was actually a, a, young, a young man, right, a lad, who brought his lunch, like they say, he brought his lunch, and he was the one that contributed this meal to Jesus. And what can we learn from there? You know, and this is a very, very common lesson when you talk about the feeding of the 5,000 is you don't have to have, you don't have to be a superstar and have the 200 penny worth to feed everyone. If you just are willing to give what you have to Jesus, you leave the multiplica multiplication of that work to Jesus. So because sometimes people get the mindset of like, oh, you know, who am I? What is my contribution to this church? You know, I'm not anything. I'm only doing this little bit. Well, you know what? If you give what you have to Jesus, leave the multiplication of that to Jesus. So don't get discouraged just because you have a little. Yeah, the lad only have five loaves and it's always like two little fishes. But are you giving what you have to Jesus, right? Whether it's your money or whether it's your time, right? Because these are equivalent, right? Your money is just a measure, economic measure of your time that you invest. Whatever you give, you leave that multiplication of Jesus. And what do we see here? The young man was willing to give what he had to Jesus, right? Because he could have just, like if everyone was hungry, everyone started, what do you think he could have done? Man, I better look after him. Where's this food going to come? I better not tell anyone I've got some food so I can eat, right? But what was he willing to do? He was willing to give it to the Lord and the Lord multiplied it and it ended up feeding everybody from that. So, don't be discouraged at the little you can do. And it's not always resources. You know, sometimes it's just being here. Sometimes it's just being, but sometimes it's just your involvement that may spark something in somebody else. I mean, how many times, I mean, so many times I've seen just in my own personal experience where people have been encouraged from just having other people at church or somebody did something, you know, somebody was willing to do something and that sparked like, oh yeah, somebody else is going to, and then it snowballed right? So things like that happen. You don't want to underestimate your involvement in things. But you know what? It can happen the other way too. Because what if the lad had refrained? He would have stopped something great 
it's something Jesus could have done great. So it's the same in our church, right? If you're doing, if you could give something and you think, oh, you know what, I'm not going to do it, you may be stopping something great as well happening from that. So there is a lad here which had five barley loaves and two small fishes. And what are they among so many? Right? So even they had the mindset of like, what is this going to do? Right? But we forget who we're dealing with. Right? We forget. Sometimes we think about the things that we're doing for God and we just think, what is it accomplishing? Well, we don't need to focus on that. We just focus on giving what we can to God and let God do the rest. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Then there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples. Look again, it mentions it. He distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. So they were all filled. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracles that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. So that's what we learn from John. What we learn from John is a bit of insight into why Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, go and buy, right? Also we learn where those five barley loaves and fishes came from and also we're encouraged by the example of this young lad of giving what he had to jesus and leaving the multiplication up to jesus now in in my third point i've got the feeding of the four thousand now if you're not familiar with the gospel stories you may not realize this but there are actually two times where Jesus fed a multitude of people. So we are familiar with the feeding of the 5,000, but are you familiar with the feeding of the 4,000? And the thing is, this happens after the feeding of the 5,000. And you'll notice the similarities in the feeding of the 4,000 to the feeding of the 5,000. And what sort of boggles your mind is, why are the disciples still having the same mindset? You know, after Jesus just fed 10, 15,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. Are they still wondering how a multitude of people are going to get, uh, are going to get, uh, going to get fed? I mean, I don't know why that is, but obviously it's an example to us because we can learn from it. Uh, Jesus, and Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet. And he healed them, insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. So this is where Jesus is healing many people. So this is the same. So this is not the same story, even though it sounds very similar. That's why you may have read this and just, you know, thought, oh, maybe this is the same story. No, it's actually a different story. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? So that always boggles my mind of like, how did they have so little faith that even though they had just fed so many thousands of people with five loaves and two fishes, are they still questioning how we're going to feed this multitude? But I think the lesson here for us is in the same way we doubt God. You know, like we, like God may have delivered you from something in the past. God may have done something for you in the past, but yet when that hard trial comes again, you're back to like wondering, how am I going to get through this? You know, it's like I couldn't figure out how to buy all the bread for these people. Jesus got you through it. And then you come to the same scenario and you go back to thinking, how am I going to get do this, right? And you think, well, isn't that a reminder for you to trust God again with the things that you can't control, the multiplication? But what's the direct application of this story, right? The direct application of this story really is salvation. And we'll see this later on. But even in terms of salvation, people get caught up in going back to earning God's grace and his love by works. How so? Because you know when you got saved, 
God paid for it all. You didn't earn his love. You don't, you don't, you don't uh, get saved and think, oh man, look how good I am that God loves me. You realize it was not of me. It was nothing I did. It was an unmerited favor where God extended his love to me and I got it undeservedly through faith. But then what happens? You live your life, you know, maybe you're going, you're living in sin, and you start thinking, oh man, God doesn't love me anymore. God, you know, is, you know I've, I've lost my salvation. People start getting into that. I'm not living right. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I don't deserve God's love. God's, you know, God's forsaken me. That's kind of like us going back to trying to buy the bread. Because if you think about it, they're, they're, the disciples, they're being, they're, Jesus is testing them. This is the bread of life. If you think about the, the story that's been given, but they're thinking, how do I get this bread? How do I buy this bread? How do I earn this bread out of my own works to feed the multitude? So it's the same thing where they've already realized God's provided that bread of life, but when they come across it again, they're still thinking, how do I do this? How do I earn back God's love? Rather than realizing, no, God has already provided salvation, his love and his mercy. We are doing things in response to that. When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? Jesus said unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven and a few little fishes. So you see how this is actually different now. It's not the five loaves and two fishes. It is seven and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks, and break them, and gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. So even this time he does it the same way. right? It's not that the multitude comes to him to get the bread and the fish. The disciples are tasked to go and bring it to them. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets full, and they that did eat were 4,000 men beside women and children. So again, it's not even the feeding of the 4,000. It's actually the feeding of the 4,000 men plus women and children. Who knows how many people were there? 10,000 and whatnot? Who knows? Um... So, with that in mind, I want to just talk, I want to talk through John 6. Because when we think about the meaning of the miracle, what is the lesson that is being taught here? Because oftentimes, the feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the 5,000 is used in regards to Jesus providing Christians things. Like, you know, because the people will say, and, you know, even, and it's not wrong to use that analogy in terms of, you know, you give, like I'm saying, you give what you can and God can multiply that. That's a perfectly valid um, application. But what is the direct teaching that Jesus is trying to teach through this miracle? It's actually a teaching about salvation. This is what he is teaching his disciples in terms of not focusing on the physical bread, but focusing on the teaching and of salvation. Now, in Matthew 16, this is where, again, the disciples, for some reason, even though he's fed 5,000, he's fed 4,000, they get to a point where they don't have bread again, they're still thinking about, oh, like we, don't have, we didn't prepare ourselves and actually bring some physical bread. In Matthew 16, so notice we've gone from 14, 15, 16. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take in bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, is it, it, it is because we have taken no bread. So you see how notice the disciples are so focused on the physical bread, they're completely missing the spiritual lesson that Jesus is trying to teach them through this miracle. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets he took up, neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets he took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So this is when they realize, you see how they're so focused on what is Jesus trying to teach us about this physical bread that they're completely missing the spiritual lesson, right? The spiritual lesson is about how God provides the bread of life for salvation. And then they realize, ah, this is why he's telling us 
beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He's not saying because it's, it's like, is our bread going to be corrupted by some yeast that they've like put into our bread? You know? And they're like, ah, oh, so the bread represents a doctrine, something that he's teaching us spiritually. And what are we bewaring of? Bewaring of the, fa- the leaven, the false teaching creeping into that doctrine. So what is it? What is that representing? We have to beware of false gospels. We have to beware of work salvation. That is the the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees trying to justify themselves. And that's what happens in churches. You know, churches that believe salvation by grace, but this whole, you need to repent of your sins to be saved, biblical repentance, and they just start by, oh, you know, if you're saved, you'll live right. There will be change. That's the leaven that starts creeping in. And then that gets preached and preached and preached and preached. And then you start talking to people in that church and they just full-blown believe work salvation. Why? Because if that leaven multiplies and grows and gets spread, if we're not aware of it. That's why when people, we talk about salvation, it's like, oh, why are you so nitpicky about what people say and how people phrase salvation? Why, why, do I, why, do, why does it like, annoy me when people say, you get saved, make Jesus the Lord, your Lord and Saviour? Because to me, that's that leaven creeping in. I don't want people to get confused later on when they keep repeating, Lord and Saviour, Lord and Saviour. And then they learn what it means to make Jesus your Lord. And then they're like, is that, is that what I had to do to get saved? And then they start believing a work salvation. So we don't want that leaven to creep in. That's why we want to be very clear on how we explain salvation, how, how it's understood, how it's preached. So that Because we, like Jesus says here, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees because we are going out and bringing that bread to the multitude, right? And if you don't think about how you explain the gospel, how you explain these things, that leaven of the Pharisees, that leaven of work salvation may creep in to the minds of people. And they, you, you, you know what you mean when you say, you know, make Jesus the Lord of your life, right? Commit your life to Jesus. What you may be mean by that, yeah, it's like your life, your eternal life, you're committing to him, right? But then what people hear is, okay, you're willing to serve him. You know, so we have to be aware of that level because then somebody, you tell somebody that at the door, oh, commit your life to Jesus. Then they go to church. Oh, that's what commit your life to Jesus means. You know, because they teach them that it means to serve and keep his commandments. And then they start thinking it's work salvation. So beware of the, Pharise- the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now with that in mind, I want to take you to John 6 and just talk through John 6 so now you understand where people go wrong with you know, Jesus saying, eating my flesh, drinking my blood, and what the lesson is here. Because remember, John 6 is the feeding of the 5,000 in John 6, right? So after that miracle happens, this is Jesus now explaining and expounding on this whole concept of the bread of life and this bread that came this bread of feeding the people of the multitude. John 6, the day following when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there save that one wherein his disciples were entered and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread after that the Lord had given thanks. So this is now the multitude because Jesus sent his disciples away. He went apart into a mountain to pray. Then, you know, that's all that stuff happens on the sea, right? And then um, the multitude now are looking for Jesus, right? Because they're like, where did Jesus go? Like his boat's not here, the boat's not here. So they go and get in a boat and try and follow him. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. So people are looking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? When did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, so verily, verily, if you didn't know, means truly, truly, I say unto you, like verity, verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, look at this, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves that were filled. So you see how people, they are not even thinking about the spiritual significance of the miracle, they just want to get fed. They just want, they're just focusing on the physical bread. So this is the main point of this story is the the difference between the physical and the spiritual bread. The physical bread that if you eat, you'll die and the spiritual bread that if you receive, you will live forever. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, 
but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Now, this verse has been used many a times to say, hey, work for things that matter. Work for things that have eternal value. And that is, that's biblical, that's right. But that's not the direct application of what's being taught here, right? What he's saying here, because the, the direct application is in salvation. He says, labor not for the meat that perisheth. What? Because if you just eat physical bread, eventually you die. But if you eat the bread of life, you will live. That's the bread you want to labor for, right? So you're not laboring for the meat that perishes. You are laboring for the spiritual bread. Now, this is where people get it wrong where they think that's teaching that you're working for your salvation because this is when they ask. So Jesus says, Endure unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then say they unto him, said they unto him, What shall we do that mean we might work the works of God? So you see how he's saying, Don't labor for the meat that perishes, labor for the bread of life, the eternal life. And they're thinking, Oh, well, we actually have to do some works in order to get that eternal life. So they say, well, Jesus, what are the works of God that we have to do to get that eternal life? And look at how he answers. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he had sent. So how do you labor, like in Hebrew says, labor to enter into that rest? How do you labor for the meat that endureth unto everlasting life? You believe on Jesus Christ. So this is now the difference in John 6 of what is he talking about when he's talking about eating physical bread versus how do you eat the spiritual bread? He said it very clear, right? Believe on Jesus Christ. So now when we go into John 6, it's, it's quite interesting because this is where people get sort of offended and what is he saying? But Jesus has already really said what he's saying, right? He's already saying, like, in order to partake of the spiritual bread, which is the real lesson, right? Because you consider not the miracles of the low, you're just seeking the physical bread. He's saying, no, the way you partake of the spiritual bread is by faith. Right? You believe in it. Then said therefore unto him, what sign shall us? And now they talk about, well, what sign are you going to show us that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. So he's saying, hey, in the Old Testament, Moses, which is what we're following in the law of Moses, hey, he was given a sign. Our fathers did eat manna in the, in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread to heaven from eat, to, to eat. So what are they missing? They're saying, hey, well, Moses had a sign because he, like the scripture says, God gave them bread to heaven to eat. And I believe this scripture is actually in Nehemiah. I was looking for it. It's in Nehemiah where he says he gave them bread to heaven to eat. Um, now they think that refers to the manna that came from heaven where they physically ate that was given by Moses. But Jesus corrects them. He says, no, then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. So what is he saying? When God said he gave them bread from heaven to eat, it wasn't the manna from heaven that he was actually referring to. Right? Because in the Old Testament, these things are prophetical. Right? There are these dark sayings that, are, that may refer to a spiritual truth, but this is the problem that people are misunderstanding them and thinking, oh, that was the bread that they actually ate, the manna in the wilderness. And Jesus is saying, no, that... That wasn't the bread that God was referring to. Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So what do we find out? When the Bible says he gave them bread from heaven to eat, it's actually prophetical of Jesus, the word of God, the living bread coming from heaven and being sent to us, right? And of being, being manifested in the flesh as the bread of life. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So you see how that bread of life. See how I'm saying that when they gave out the bread, that bread is multiplied. It's the word of God that it's applying, being applied to. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Right? So they're saying, hey, there's this bread that came down here. They're saying they want it. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. So you see how Jesus is not being unclear about how this bread of life is. When he goes through John 6, right? Later on, when he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, he's already explained this to them. He that cometh to me, shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. So you see how he's saying, this is how you eat of that spiritual bread. You believe on him. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me 
and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. So that is eternal security there. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which he hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should, ra I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So this is, now you can put it into context when it says, hey, not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So what is the will of the Father in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven? To believe on him, right? That you may have everlasting life. I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. So they're like wondering, like, how is this man the bread that came down from heaven? What they don't understand is Jesus is the word of God manifested in the flesh. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, Joseph, whose father and mother we know? So you see how they, was Joseph Jesus' physical father? No. So you see, this is where they don't realize who Jesus is. How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught, all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. So Jesus is explaining some spiritual truths there that are quite deep. So we'll just skip over those for the sake of time. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So again, you see how he's reiterating this, you believe on him to get that bread of life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. So you see there again the comparison between the physical and the spiritual. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Now notice here how he's comparing the physical and the spiritual, because that's why they keep thinking back to the physical. But we know that this passage is always used by people that believe in transubstantiation, which is when they, when they eat of the bread in the cup, they actually believe it physically turns into Jesus' body and Jesus' blood. Uh, and they think, well, that's why you have to eat of it in order to you know, receive the sacraments and receive the grace, and you have to do this in order to earn your salvation. Well, this, I remember raising this once with, with somebody that was trying to tell me about that. Is, you know, it says here in verse 51, it says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. So the question is, if, if eating physically of that bread is eating physically of Jesus' body and drinking of his physical blood, why do you have to keep doing it? Because if I've eaten of it, I no longer will die. Right? And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So even if they believed that that was a physical body and blood of Jesus, technically they would, should believe that you'd only have to do it once and yeah. you'd be saved forever. Yeah. Right? Because once you partake of that bread, and that cup, but they don't believe that, right? Because they believe you have to keep taking it in order to stay safe. But we know, well, how do you get this bread that's going to make you live forever? Obviously, if you just eat something physical, you still die physically. So that's why it's a spiritual truth that you believe on him and you have everlasting life spiritually. One day we'll be given a new body. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So you see how they are still confused. They're still thinking, I have to eat something physically as opposed to believing on him and getting that spiritual bread. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And this is where Jesus, knowing what they're thinking, now he's just saying things to kind of trip them up, right? So this is why, you know, this is how Jesus operates, right? Because he's already saying things to his disciples just to prove them to see what they think. So then he says, Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you. So now he's just plainly stating something in, a, in an analogous way, right? Just like he's saying to his disciples, well, go and buy for them to eat knowing what he's going to do. 
except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Now in the context of this passage, has Jesus at any time before this told them to eat of something physical? No, he's, he's comparing the physical bread with the spiritual bread. So here, of course, he's not saying, I want you to literally eat my flesh and drink my blood. Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So again, I ask the Catholic and the Orthodox, why, when you eat the bread, must you keep eating it? Right? So it's not, obviously not what Jesus is teaching, because if, I, if that truly was what he was saying about transubstantiation, you'd only have to eat it once. So there is something spiritual behind here where we do something once. What do we do to get eternal life? We put our faith in Jesus Christ. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. So you see how even his disciples knew that he was saying something spiritual, right? So they didn't hear Jesus say, eat my flesh and blood, and say, yeah, he's probably meaning somehow we've got to eat pieces of his body and actually get the blood from his body and drink it. They knew that, man, they're like, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Because he, they know that Jesus is speaking in parables and dark sayings and saying something. Like, Whoa, people are going to get tripped up by this because he's saying we have to eat something. But they know, like, what does this really mean? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? Right? It's like saying, does this upset you, what I'm saying? What and if he shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? And now Jesus again clarifies his statements. The flesh profiteth nothing. So when he's saying you eat of my flesh, if you actually literally take that as his bodily flesh, it's going to profit you nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So again, he's pointing them back. It's the words that he speaks. That is the bread of life not the physical bread that we must believe in order to have life in us. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So you see there, the spiritual application of the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. So we learn some lessons where, you know, we often doubt God, especially when it comes to our salvation. Sometimes we know we're saved, we know we've been saved, but we start to doubt God's love and grace and think we have to earn that. You know, we earn God's love and grace. Now, there's a difference between earning God's grace and earning his love and trying to do things that are pleasing to God, right? Because you can do things that are displeasing to God. That doesn't mean God doesn't love you anymore. You know, it's like with our children. Do, do our children do things that are displeasing to us? Yeah, but does that mean we don't love them? No, no, we still love them. You know, when we chastise our children, does that mean we don't love them? No, of course we still love them. So when we start getting into the mindset of I'm being chastised because God no longer loves me, and you start getting back into the trying to buy the 200 penny worth of bread, that's how you get back into that mindset of trying to earn God's favor. We understand that we have to bring out the gospel to people we understand that that bread of life is spiritual right so we're not partaking of something physical in order to get life we believe on jesus that's how we labor for that meat and when you have that in mind this is what jesus is talking now when you go through john 6 you realize that's what he's expounding on and even when he gets to the hard saying that is often misused to teach transubstantiation you realize no he's actually just saying a hard saying and the spiritual truth is you need to believe on the lord jesus christ and this is really where you know you would explain the last supper and communion and whatnot because John 6 is really the, the meat of that doctrine. So not only that, we have to beware of false teaching as well. So beware about how we explain the gospel, what we understand about the gospel, and that, that works salvation, 
getting back to our works, what we earn, what we buy with our own works, getting uh, that grace of God. Anyways, I hope you learned something more about this story. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. I just thank you uh, that we are assured, uh, even from you know, hard passages in the New Testament, that salvation is by grace. And Lord, help us not to get tripped up with a lot of the hard sayings of our Lord Jesus Christ, trying to reveal our heart. We have the clear teaching from the epistles in the New Testament that salvation is by grace. Uh, Lord, if we had to earn your grace and love by our works, that would be impossible. So I just thank you, Lord. Thank you that, uh, you know, this, this example of the feeding of the 5,000 and 4,000, help us, Lord, to give what we can to you and just leave the multiplication up to you. So we thank you, Lord, for being gracious to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.